Tomorrow, I die. And today, I want to tell the world what happened, and thus, perhaps, free my soul from the horrible weight in which lies upon it. But listen, listen, and you shall hear how I have been destroyed. When I was a child, I had a natural goodness of soul, which led me to love animals. All kinds of animals but especially those animals we call pets. Animals which have learned to live with men and share their homes with them. There is something in the love of these animals which beats directly to the heart of the man, who has learned from experience how uncertain and changeable is the love of other men. I was quite young when I married. You will understand the joy I felt to find that my wife shared with me the love of animals. Quickly, she got for us several pets of the most likeable kind. We had a bird, some goldfish, a fine dog, and a cat. The cat was a beautiful animal, of unusually large size and entirely black. I named the cat Pluto and it was the pet I liked the best. I alone fed it, and it followed me all around the house. It was even with difficulty that I stopped it from following me through the street. Our friendship lasted, in this manner, for several years, during which, however, my own character became greatly changed. I began to drink too much wine and other strong drinks, as the days passed, I became less loving in my manner, and I became quick to anger. I forgot how to smile and laugh. My wife, yes, and my pets too, all except the cat, were made to feel the change in my character. One night I came home, quite late from the inn, where I now spend most of my time drinking. Walking with uncertain steps, I made my way with effort into the house. As I entered, I saw, or thought I saw, that Pluto, the cat, was trying to stay out of my way, to avoid me. This action, by an animal which I thought had loved me, made me angry beyond belief. My soul seemed to fly from my body. I took a small knife out of my coat. I opened it. Then I took the poor animal by the neck, and with one quick movement I cut out one of its fear-filled eyes. Slowly the cat got well. The hole where its eye had been was not a pretty thing to look at. It is true, but the cat no longer appeared to suffer any pain. As might be expected, however, it ran from me in fear whenever I came near. Why should it not run? Yet this did not fail to anger me. I felt growing inside of myself a new feeling. Who has not, a hundred times, found himself doing wrong? Doing some evil thing for no other reason than because he knows he should not. Are not we humans at all pushed? even driven in some unknown way to break the law just because we understand it to be the law. One day, in cold blood, I tied a strong rope around my cat's neck and taking it down into the cellar under the house, I hung it from one of the wooden beams above my head. I hung it there until it was dead. I hung it there with tears in my eyes. I hung it because I knew it had loved me. Because I felt it had given me no reason to hurt it. Because I knew that my doing so was a wrong so great. A sin so deadly that it would place my soul forever outside the reaches of God. That same night, as I lay sleeping... I heard through my open window the cries of our neighbour. 
I jumped from my bed and found the entire house was filled with fire. It was only with great difficulty that my wife and I escaped. And when we were out of the house, all we could do was stand and watch it burn to the ground. I thought of the cat as I watched it burn. The cat, whose dead body I had left hanging in the cellar, it had seemed almost that the cat had in some mysterious way caused the house to burn down, so that it could make me pay for my evil act so that it could take revenge upon me. Months went by, and I could not drive the thought of the cat out of my mind. One night, I sat in the inn, drinking, as usual. In the corner, I saw a dark object that I had not seen before. I went over to see what it could be. It was a cat. A cat, almost exactly like Pluto. I touched it with the back of my hand and I petted it. Passing my hand softly along its back, the cat rose and pushed its back against my hand. Suddenly, I realised that I wanted the cat. I offered to buy it from the innkeeper, but he claimed he had never seen the animal before. As I left the inn, It followed me, and I allowed it to do so. It soon became a pet of both my wife and myself. The morning after I brought it home, however, I discovered that this cat, like Pluto, had one eye. How was it possible that I had not noticed this the night before? This fact only made my wife love the cat more. But I myself found a feeling of dislike growing inside of me that my growing dislike of the animal only seemed to increase its love for me it followed me followed me everywhere always when I sat it lay down under my chair when I stood up it got between my feet and nearly made me fall wherever I went it was always there At night, I dreamt of it, and I began to hate that cat. One day, my wife called me from the cellar of the old building where we now were forced to live. As I went down the stairs, the cat, following me as always, ran under my feet and nearly threw me down. In sudden anger, I took an axe and struck wildly at the cat. Quickly. My wife put her hand to stop my arm. This only increased my anger, and without thinking, I turned and I put the axe into her brain. She fell to the floor and died without a sound. I spent a few moments looking at the cat, but it was gone. I must do something with the body, and quickly. Suddenly, I noticed a place in the wall of the cellar where stones had been added to the wall to cover the old fireplace which was no longer wanted. The walls were not very strongly built and I found I could easily take down those stones. Behind them there was, as I knew there must be, a hole just big enough to hold the body. With much effort I put the body in and carefully put the stones back in their place. I was pleased to see that it was quite impossible for anybody to know that a single stone had been moved. Days passed. Still, there was no cat. A few people came to ask about my wife, but I answered them easily. Then, one day, several officers of the police came. Certain that they could not find nothing, I asked them in and went with them as they searched. Finally, they searched the cellar from end to end. I watched them quietly, and, as I expected, they found nothing. But as they started up the stairs again, I felt myself driven by some unknown inner force to let them know, to make them know, I had won the battle. 
The walls of this building, I said, are very strongly built. It is a fine old house. As I spoke, I struck with my stick the very place in the wall behind which the body of my wife. Immediately, I felt a cold feeling go up and down my back. As we heard coming out of the wall itself a horrible cry. For one short moment, the officers stood and looked at each other. Then quickly, they began to pick at the stone. And in a short time, they saw before them the body of my wife. Black with dried blood and smelling of decay. On the body's head, its one eye filled with fire. Its wide open mouth, the colour of blood, sat the cat, crying out its revenge. Hi everyone and welcome back to the Dark History Podcast, where we explore the darkest parts of human history. I hope everybody is well. I'm Rob, your host as always. Welcome to the new episode, and the eagerly awaited Halloween special. Well, I hope eagerly awaited Halloween special anyway. Strap yourselves in because this one is going to be a monster episode. Pun most definitely intended. I hope you enjoyed the modernised rendition of Edgar Allan Poe's The Black Cat. I know it's sacrilegious to change the works of a gothic genius such as Edgar Allan Poe, but if anybody has read the original Black Cat story, or The Raven, for example, you will see that the language and the style of writing is incredibly different to ours nowadays. So please forgive me for trying to make it a little easier for an illiterate dumb brute such as myself. After that huge caveat, let's get down to the episode. Last year our Halloween special was about the story of the Pendle Witches and their trials and tribulations. I chose this as it was relatively close to where I live. In keeping with the tradition of witches on Halloween, and to take into the account the demographic of my listeners, I thought I would bring you the most infamous witch trial of all, the Salem Witch Trials. But then I thought, no, this topic has been well trodden. So I pondered, and I pondered, and I tried to delve into obscurity. And what did I come out with? More witch trials. Yep, more witch trials. But these witch trials are slightly more obscure and showcase the sheer brutality that humans can inflict. Obligatorily, I must warn you that this Halloween special is not for the faint-hearted. We are about to descend into the rabbit hole of some of the most darkest tales imaginable. Nothing and nobody was off limits in these stories, no matter the age. So with that warning out of the way, please turn off those lights sit back and relax under the blanket for the final part of our spooky season specials and more dark history we start our episode in the fairy tale invoking landscape of alpine austria perched amongst the rugged landscape of the lugan region of salzburg is Musham Castle. The white stone medieval castle transcends out of the many snow-tipped pine forests that blanket the area like a magnificent relic to times gone by. Please, my dear listeners, don't let this idyllic picture of a magical castle adorned with snowy pine forests cascading down mighty granite mountains fool you. This seemingly beautiful picturesque image in your mind should be tarnished and awashed with blood and gore. You see, this mighty 12th century castle is the setting to the darkest and most inhumane witch trials Europe has ever seen. Musham Castle was first documented in a deed in 1191. 
possibly built on the foundation of a Roman fortress. Musham Castle has seen many tragedies. Throughout the sands of time, Musham has bore witness to local wars, the Crusades, several Austrian-Hungarian wars, and the Flemish revolt against Maximilian of Austria between the years of 1428 and 1482. The castle has seen its share of sieges, with the besieging by the peasants during the German Peasant War, between the years of 1524 and 1525, being the most notable. So it isn't far-fetched to say that the ground is saturated with blood. But among the many stories of wars and sieges, there is one period in history that's even more gruesome than all these together. The so-called Jubiakl Trials lasted from 1675 until 1690. Within this span of some 15 years, the area was gripped by an insatiable appetite of righteousness, which elevated into a bloodthirsty bout of mass hysteria. These fear-filled but delusional 15 years would see Musham Castle take centre stage. These dark and macabre events begin with the simple arrest of a woman named Berber Collarin for the crimes of theft and sorcery in 1675. She was put on trial along with her partner Paul Calthampatra. During torture, Barbara confessed that her son, Paul Jacob Collar, had made a pact with Satan. Paul Calthampatra confirmed her story, but Barbara was executed in August of that year, and the hunt for Jacob began. In 1677, the government received the news that Jacob was dead, but when they arrested a young beggar named Dionysus Feldner, the news was contradicted. The 12-year-old handicapped Feldner, also known as Dirty Animal, told the authorities that he had been in contact with Jacob shortly before his arrest. According to him, Jacob, or Yakel, was the leader of a gang of beggar children and teenagers from the slum. Feldner also claimed that Yakel had taught the children black magic. His confession led to the arrest of hundreds of homeless children and teenagers. During the interrogations, the stories of Yakul grew larger and larger. In the end, the authorities even feared the man for his bloodthirst and cruelty, and they actually preferred to avoid capturing the man. So even though Yakul was the most famous wizard in the city's history, he was never captured. Instead, the witch hunt for the homeless children and the teenagers continued. As the years fell away, a total of 139 people were killed, with Mushan Castle being the epicentre of the administration, the court, the imprisonment, the torture, and ultimately the execution. Of the 139 executed, 113 were male. They were executed because they were loyal followers of Yakul. 39 were just children. The youngest, Han Earl, was only 10 years old. 53 executed were aged between 15 and 21. 21 executed were of unknown age. The oldest to be executed was Marguerite Rainberg, who was 80 years old when she was killed. The execution of people for something as fanciful as witchcraft is barbaric enough but then to compound it with the execution of children, well, you have some truly dark history. But what is frankly heartbreaking and tips this story's protagonists into the realm of fictitious supervillainy are the methods used on these children. The sadistic authorities would progress the torture very slowly, using various methods. 
Once they had what they wanted, a small mercy was offered in three forms, hanging, decapitation, or burning alive at the stake, and these were the lucky ones. Some children had their hands cut off, and markings burned into their chests. These children were then paraded round for the locals as a warning before ultimately entering the torture chamber until they confessed and then they were given the same three mercies. Strangely, as sadistic and murderous as this story was, Musham Castle wasn't completely clear of fairy tale monsters. As the witch hunts ended in 1690, life at Musham Castle turned back to normal. This lasted until 1790, when the Archbishop Count Hieronymus von Collado dissolved Musham's bailiwick. Without the church's finances, the castle fell into disrepair. Not long after this event, the local deer and stock were found mutilated and killed in areas surrounding the castle. The superstitious locals started pointing at the remaining residents of the castle. Somewhat laughably, they believed those people turned into werewolves at night, feasting on the flesh of the unfortunate animals. The locals went up to the castle, pitchforks and torches in hand, and captured the residents brutally murdering them in their own courtyard. After this, the castle was abandoned. Moving north from Austria to the land of Sweden, famed for its marauding bands of merciless Vikings that terrorised Europe during the Middle Ages, Sweden is seen as a civilised and prosperous country nowadays. Between those polar opposites in time, the country of Sweden has seen some bloody and equally dark periods throughout its history. Notably, Swedes suffered the wrath of King Christian II of Denmark in 1519, when, in a bid to break free of the Kalmar Union, which was a personal union between the countries of Denmark, Norway and Sweden, the king invaded and arrested the rebellious nobility and massacred 80 of them at the end of a feast in honour of his coronation. The Swedes would again suffer at the hands of a king in 1700 when King Charles XII invaded Russia. At first the Great Northern War went well for Sweden single-handedly knocking out the countries of Poland and Denmark. Even the Russians sued for peace in 1708, but the cocky King Charles managed to snatch defeat out the jaws of victory by continuing to fight the Russians. Being utterly routed at the Battle of Poltava in 1709 and losing Sweden its status as a military power in Europe. As the Aachen as bloody as some of these events were, I am digressing for what the main topic of this episode is about. As the bloodbath in Austria was beginning, another was too in its infancy. In the year 1674, the village of Torsaker, Sweden, was a typical rural Swedish village. The earthy red wooden houses, with their steep thatch roofs, were meticulously placed around the church, which lay in the centre of the village. The surrounding landscape was a mismatch of brown, yellow and green. The people would be toiling in this agricultural tapestry, ever changing with the season. Even today, Torsaker boasts a population of no more than 889. So, you'd be forgiven for thinking nothing more of Torsaker than a small, unassuming rural Swedish village. But in 1674, Torsaker became the very heart of Sweden's biggest witch trials. The witch trials reached Torsaker as a result and consequence of a great wave of witch hysteria known as the Stora Ovasendet, which had begun to flourish over Sweden 
after the trial caused by Gertrude Svendotter against Marek Jan's daughter in Dalarna in 1668. Sweden did not have a separation of church and state, causing state-employed Lutheran priests to abide by governmental instructions. The Lutheran clergy were ordered to use their sermons to inform their congregation of the crimes committed. Thus, the rumours of the witches spread over the country, where witch hunts had early been a rarity. The trial began when Johannes Watrangius of Torsega Parish told Laurentius Christophery Honeus of Jurlanus Parish to investigate witchcraft in his parish. On the 15th of October 1674, the witch trials of Torsaker opened. About 100 people of both sexes were accused. The young Horneus started the job with a great determination to succeed. Both Watrangius and Horneus saw themselves as chosen to fight evil. They were convinced that there was a giant struggle between good and evil and that the witches were the tools of the devil. To save the souls of the witches, and to spur them the eternal fire of hell, it was necessary to get the witches to confess. Both Watrangius and Honeus believed that torture was necessary to accomplish that goal. Witnesses were also tortured to get suitable stories. It was common to use children as witnesses, and they were often children of the accused women. The children were telling dreadful stories of how they had been brought to Black Ullo, the place of the devil in Nordic tales. Not quite hell, but a place where the devil held blankets. They told what they had experienced there, what they had seen and who they had seen. The children tried to outshine each other with their fantasy stories. If accused, the women would be subjected to the water test. The accused women were tied up and thrown into a lake, river or some other body of water. If she sank and drowned, then she was innocent. However, if she floated on the water, she would be condemned as a witch and was to be executed. The women were beheaded first, and then their bodies were burnt on the bonfire. This method would be used after the last sermon in the church of Torsaker. The prisoners, 71 people, 65 women and 6 men, were led to the place of execution, which was on the mountain, half a mile from all three churches, called the Mountain of the Stake. Many fainted on the way, out of weakness and fear, and those were carried by their families up into the place of execution. On the mountain, a grim sight awaited. Stakes had been preemptively driven into the ground and kindling placed around, ready for the inevitable burning. The prisoners were decapitated away from the stakes, so as not to drown the wood in blood and make it hard to light. And when they were dead, the families took off their clothes and lifted their bodies onto the stake, which were lit and burnt until they went out by themselves. The Torsaker executions had, even at the time they occurred, dubious legitimacy. Neither the commission or any other local court had the right to conduct any executions. It was the job of the higher court to determine the sentencing. The local court were merely there to report back. In the case of Torsaker, the local court commission did not report the sentence into the high court, but executed the prisoners directly without confirmation of the sentencing from their superiors, and the executions were therefore not lawful. The commission was also called from Torsaker to the capital to answer for their actions. They were defended by the local authorities in Torsaker, but there would be no more executions. 
the witch hunts in the country continued. After the Torsaker witch trial, it reached the capital, where it lasted until 1676, and ended with the execution of Malin Matsdotter during the Katarina witch trials in Stockholm. Malin would be the only woman burnt at the stake alive in Sweden. After the execution of Malin Matsdotter, the authorities proved that the child witnesses were lying and it had been a mistake. In 1677, all the priests in the country were ordered to tell their congregations in the churches that the witches had now been expelled from the country forever to avoid further witch trials. In Tarsaka, two boys who had pointed women out as witches were found with their throats cut. British Isles in 1603 were a very different place to today. Scotsmen, Englishmen and Welshmen in 1603 would all meet in a field with their armour and chain mail and have a good old dust up to the death as they had done for centuries. Nowadays it's just a passive aggressive hatred of each other that only really boils over when the football or rugby is on or when the talk of independence rears its head from a politician's mouth. So why does the year of 1603 have any significance? Well, 1603 was the year King James VI of Scotland also became James I of England and united the two kingdoms. What does King James I have to do with witches? Well, James certainly had a strange fascination with all things associated with the occult. Shortly after assuming the throne, he released his best-selling book, Demonology, which explored the areas of witchcraft and demonic magic. He was so obsessed with the Black Arts that he even convinced Parliament to pass the witchcraft status of 1604, which ruled witchcraft as a crime punishable by death. Such a background led to heightened public anxiety about witches that would slowly fester in the decades to follow. Inspired in no small part by similar concerns across the channel in mainland Europe. Within the political and religious chaos that reigned throughout the period of the English Civil War, one previously unheard of name was on everybody's lips. That name, Matthew Hopkins. Records of Hopkins' early career in the art of witch hunting are a tad vague. However, it appears to stem from when he moved to Manningtree, Essex in 1644. An impoverished lawyer with a strong puritanical background, Hopkins appeared to have seen it as his mission to destroy anything to do with the work of the devil. Hopkins believed that there were several witches regularly practicing their dark arts close to his home and apparently began his career as a witch finder after he overheard various women discussing their meeting with the devil in March of 1644. Of the 23 women accused of witchcraft, four were said to have died in prison with 19 later convicted and hanged. Hopkins appeared to have assumed the title of Witchfinder General in 1645, claiming to be officially commissioned by Parliament with the brief to uncover and prosecute witches. Together with his entourage, that included a merry band of lady pickers, they travelled the villages and towns of eastern England, trying and examining women for witchcraft. Of course, all of this came at a very reasonable price, said to be 20 shillings a town, although the records reveal that the small market town of Stowmarket paid £23 for his service. A true entrepreneur, Hopkins appeared to have quickly turned his mission into a well-paid career, so much so that local taxes were even levied in order to fund his obsession. Many of the methods that Hopkins adopted to investigate these cases of witchcraft 
were taken directly from King James's best-selling demonology. And although considerably less violent than other methods adopted in mainland Europe, they did include keeping a suspect awake for days on end, resulting in the subject, now suffering from sleep deprivation, being coerced into confessing to almost anything. And onto the work of those lady pickers. Well, their jobs involve cutting the arms of the accused with a knife, needle or pin. And if they did not bleed, she was said to be a witch. However, with a very good living to be earned from unmasking witches, retractable or blunt blades were often adopted. As was used in Sweden, Hopkins' favourite confessional method of torture, however, was the infamous swim test or water test. This unbelievably simple but effective test involved binding the arms and legs of the accused to a chair before throwing them into the village pond. If they sank and drowned, they were innocent and were received into heaven. If they floated, they would be tried as a witch. Between the years of 1644 and 1646, Hopkins and his associates are believed to have been responsible for the deaths of 300 women. And in the days of when an average farm worker's wage was just six pence a day, it is estimated that Hopkins may have collected fees of around a thousand pounds for his gruesome services. His own end, however, is far from clear. Some accounts say he was drowned undergoing his own swim trial after being accused of witchcraft himself. Ah, oh, Matthew Hopkins died at his home in Manningtree, Essex on the 12th of August 1647, probably of pleural tuberculosis. He was buried a few hours after his death in a graveyard in the Church of St Mary's at the Ministerial Heath. Thank you everybody for taking the time out of your day to listen to this long and dark episode. I won't waffle on too much at the end of this, but this episode has really been a labour of love and it's taken around six weeks to research, write and record. This, like every episode, is done by myself. The research, the writing, the recording and the editing. So after tonight's episode, I'm going to take a little break. I'll be back with more factually historic episodes on a bi-weekly basis in two weeks, ready for the run to Christmas. I really hope you've enjoyed this episode, and the spooky season as a whole. I still can't get past the fact that people in bygone times were executed for witchcraft. Anyway, with all that out the way, thank you again for listening. I hope everybody enjoys their Halloween and doesn't get too sick on eating too many sweets. As always, join us next time for our next episode as we delve into another event and more dark history.